Over the last few weeks, we have been looking over the story of Joseph and have been uh, considering all the baggage that we tend to accumulate in life, uh, mistakes that we have made, things that happen, uh, consequences of, of our choices, choices of other people, uh, things that just happen to us that are outside of anybody else's control. We pick up bags of some sort throughout our lives. Some people have uh, dealt with them, some people have not. And you might expect for people who have been faithful to Christ for a long time that they have since uh, dealt with their baggage, but when you get older and you spend time with people, you realize that a lot of us are really good at hiding the fact that we are carrying a bunch of baggage. Now, we've, we've been looking at this uh, from different angles, different characters in the story who dealt with uh, various situations, and they dealt with their baggage in different ways or different ways that they accumulated baggage. We talked about... Um, basically gave an overview of the story and all the different things that, that arose. Uh, we talked about Joseph's brothers and their intentional acts of sin and the baggage that caused uh, for themselves and others. Uh, last week we talked about Jacob and there was a lot of mistakes that he had made in his life, yes, but a lot of what happens to him later in life is the result of choices of other people. And he is uh, faced with the consequences. He have, he's having to deal with the consequences of other people's bad choices. But there's another person in the story uh, who deals with his baggage in a completely different way than Jacob. Jacob was paralyzed emotionally and spiritually by the things that happened to him. Uh, he was you could see how it affected his life uh, for the rest of his life, the judgment and, and how he held on to Benjamin and how uh, different, different things in his life uh, really were affected because he didn't emotionally and spiritually deal with what happened to him. He didn't process or he didn't um, allow God to bring him healing. He was stuck where he was at. And yet, there is a significant difference in how we see Joseph handling the situations that he has dealt. He has held, dealt all sorts of bad hands in life, and he um, responds to them quite differently than Jacob did. Even though he was the victim in many ways, that he did not allow that to hold him back. He, he persevered. He did something different than what Jacob uh, had done. And Joseph had, had suffered many uh, setbacks. He was the favored son. He was, he was a daddy's boy. He was the one uh, who was greatly favored. And yet he was betrayed by his brothers. And even the dreams that God had given to Jacob early in his life, which were maybe a blessing, were, were, uh, caused some of the animosity between him and his brothers. And it doesn't seem fair that he would be betrayed by his brothers. And, and then they throw him into a pit to die which is pretty bad, and he's begging for his life, and instead of killing him, they eventually sell him to some traders who sell him into slavery, and that is a terrible thing. He had absolutely no control over that as well. And so as a result of the things that he goes through, he is separated from his family for 15 to 20 years, and he does not see them. He doesn't know what has happened to them. He doesn't know if they have survived or the famine or not. He doesn't know if, they have, uh, if his father has died since he was so old. None of that. He is completely in the dark about what happens to his family. And then he's, uh, as he's in Potiphar's uh, house serving him, he is falsely accused uh, by Potiphar's wife of going after her when really it was the exact opposite. She was trying to pursue him, and he said no. And she was scorned, and uh, she took out her fury on Joseph. And so Joseph was thrown into prison. He goes uh, from this high down to this low, and he's thrown into prison and then he meets a couple of king, the king's officials who were also thrown into prison and, and they have dreams and Joseph begins to interpret their dreams and, and uh, one of them is going to be uh, killed. The other one is going to be restored to their position and Joseph tells uh, the, the cupbearer, when you are returned to your position, remember me. And Joseph maybe thinks that he is finally going to get out of this trouble. And then the cupbearer forgets about Joseph, and he languishes in prison for another couple of years. 
And so it seems like time and time again, Joseph has dealt a bad hand. He, he excels, he succeeds, and then everything is taken away from him. But despite the fact that he goes through all of this stuff in Genesis chapter 39, there's a couple of verses that really stick out. That as we are, if we are imagining ourselves hearing the story for the first time, really pop out and they, they really brighten up the whole story. In uh, 39 verse 2 we read that the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master Potiphar. And then even as he is thrown into prison after being accused by Potiphar's wife, we read this. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. And in both of these situations, Potiphar uh, gave uh, control of his whole household to Joseph. And, and the jailer puts everything in the jail underneath Joseph's control. Uh, he is being blessed. It is clear from this that we see that God is working in the story that Joseph is finding, is, is having favor with these officials. That God is somehow working in a situation so that they have a positive a view, a positive attitude about Joseph, even though he is a slave and he is a Hebrew shepherd. Both of those things to them would have uh, put him down in their esteem. There is no way that he should have been able to uh, accumulate such respect. But it's not just that God was working in that situation uh, to, in, in the hearts and in the minds of the people that he served. Joseph himself had a role to play in his success. That when God had given him the gifts that he, that he was given, like the, the gift of wisdom or administration and planning and all the things that God had enabled Joseph to do, Joseph actually used those things to serve those that he was serving. Like Joseph took the gifts and he put them to work. He could have uh, thrown himself a pity party and said, oh, gosh, why is this happening to me? Man, I, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was so blessed by my dad and... And then now I'm, I'm in a pit. Man, I was in Potiphar's house and now I'm in prison. What? You know, he, do, he doesn't do that. He doesn't throw himself a pity party. He gets off his butt and he, and he gets to work. He puts uh, the, the gifts that he had been given by God to work. And he was very successful in the things that he did. He worked hard for Potiphar. He worked hard for the jailer. And he ends up working hard for Pharaoh. And he does it not to uh, get himself glory. He doesn't do it in order um, to win favor of the people. He does it so that he can please God. You see, even when he is interpret, asked to interpret dreams, he says, it's not me who can do it. Okay. It is God who's going to give me the interpretation of your dream. It's not me at all. So, so he uh, puts himself down so that he can elevate God in all of these situations. So he was working to please God even when he had everything taken away from him. And as a result of his faithfulness, God was helping to bless him and increase him. Now this isn't a, a magic formula that, that if you work hard to please God, then you are going to be great and successful in this world. That's not what this passage is trying to tell us. It, is, it has a different lesson for us. And as Joseph is going through this story, we have the gift of hindsight. We have the gift of actually reading, reading a story for ourselves and seeing what goes on. And many of us have heard this story from childhood, so we know how it ends. But Joseph, as he is in the midst of the pit, as he is in jail, as he is uh, serving as a slave, he doesn't know how the story is going to play out. All he knows is that he needs to keep seeking after God. He needs to keep serving God and serving the ways that God is enabling him to serve. And, and I think that is the lesson for us. When we are forced into tough circumstances like Jacob or like Joseph was, we need to be more like Joseph and less like Jacob in that we need to continue to seek God and to work to please God and not throw a pity party, not get depressed, not get sad, not allow our tough circumstances to get us down, but continue to seek after God. And in these tough situations, we don't always know what God is doing. A lot of people ask, why would God let this happen? Why is, what is God doing in my life? What is the purpose of my suffering? And we don't know the answer to those questions. 
in the middle of it. We can't know the outcome of our trial. We don't know what God is trying to accomplish. We can't control what happens to us. We can't control what is going to happen in the future. The only thing that we can really control is our own response to our difficult circumstances. And the thing that we control is being faithful to God, continuing to seek Him, continuing to praise Him, continuing to serve Him to the best of our ability, to bring Him glory and not ourselves. And you might expect that as Joseph is being forced to be a slave, as he is serving, as he is uh, rotting away in prison, that you might expect him to kind of get bitter and angry at his brothers, that, that every tough thing that he is having to do, he is blaming his brothers for it. Even as Potiphar, uh, uh, Potiphar's wife um, th- has him thrown into prison, falsely accusing, you, you might think that he's going to blame it on his brothers. If, if it hadn't been for my brothers sending me away as a slave, this never would happen to me. But when you start reading how, you, how he tests his brothers when they come to buy grain from him, you, you begin to, to sense some tension. Like it seems like Joseph might be having an axe to grind. Like he accuses them of being uh, spies. He's asking them all these questions about his family. And you're just waiting for him uh, to drop the, the axe and chop off their heads. Like that is what you expect to happen as you read through the text. But that is not at all what, how it plays out. In uh, chapter 45 of our text... In Genesis, Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And this is at verse 4. And they came near and said, I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into slavery. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here, because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of his entire household, the ruler over all the land of Egypt. This is an amazing thing that you see God working out. There is uh, no doubt in the mind of Joseph and his brothers that he was wronged terribly. And instead of taking revenge, Joseph does what is unthinkable, and he forgives them. He doesn't doesn't hold it against them. He doesn't belittle them. He doesn't uh, give them a, a stern lecture. He simply forgives for what forgives them for what they has done. And not only does he forgive them, but he also tells them to forgive themselves. Uh, Stop worrying about what what you have done to me. Uh, Don't let it bother you anymore. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling, or grieve, for selling me into slavery. Forgive yourself for what you have done to me. Which is an amazing lesson. Sometimes we do need to forgive ourselves like Joseph's brothers. But in this story, we don't see any indication that Joseph held animosity through his trials. We don't see himself throwing a pity party. We don't see him plotting to get back at his brothers when he finally gets to meet them. And you don't see that he has kept any record of the wrongs done against them, against him. And I think this this is also a great lesson for us, that we need to be so quick to forgive. And we need to stop holding grudges. Now, last night at the fair, there was a tense moment as we were watching the Destruction Derby, or as the, the Crasham Derby, as Apollos calls it, whatever. Uh, we were sitting there. The kids were just playing around. Thankfully, they had their, uh, their hearing protection, their, their earmuffs on, so they couldn't necessarily hear everything that was going on. But apparently, there was a, a family here and, and a family here that they had apparently not noticed that they had sat next to each other. 
And all of a sudden, they, there's obscen obscenities being thrown out at, at each other. Like uh, there was some, some grudge, there was some, um, some, something that they were holding against each other. And this, this uh, guy called this girl a, a, a bad word. And she says, tell me that again. And like, then her family gets into it and then his family gets into it. And they're like yelling these obscenities at back and forth. And these are like grown adults acting like little babies. Um, do it again. Oh, you're wearing, you tell another girl, you're wearing a hat. You're just trying to be like a boy. Like, wow, that's original. Like, you know, they're acting like little, and this is like older people yelling at each other and yelling obscenities at each other. There was some grudge that they were holding against each other. There was some, something that had been done in the past that they were still holding against each other. I'm guessing that perhaps this man and this, this woman who were yelling at obscenity at each other probably dated at some point and it ended terribly. Um, just, just, guessing, but they were just totally going off at each other in front of the children. And somebody finally says, um, stop it, there's kids around. And, and then the guy's like, oh. and he yells them profan profanities and then comes to his senses, oh, I'm so sorry, everybody. Like, yeah, you are. Um, but forgive, forgive. But, you know, there was some, some beef that these two had against each other, some kind of um, tension that they had, and it spilled over as they're watching a destruction derby uh, race. Just have fun, people. Like, but they were, they were holding past wrongs against each other. We need to not be like that. That is how we are not supposed to act. We are to, let, we are to forgive. We are to stop holding grudges, stop holding records of wrongs. I read about that somewhere in Scripture, that love does not keep a, a record of wrongs. Um, maybe read Paul's uh, letter on, on that. Uh, but we need to be quick to forgive. Forgive other people uh, for things that they have done to us, just like Joseph did, and like Jesus said to do, and like his apostles say, okay, uh, we're supposed to forgive our brother. How many times should we forgive? Seven times, seven times seven, or whatever it is. Uh, in, in the Greek, it's kind of obscure, so now we have to do math. Okay, forget it. You know, the point is forgive and forgive and forgive. But as I mentioned, sometimes we need, might need to forgive ourselves. Sometimes we uh, go to God and we confess our sins. Uh, or maybe uh, there are things that we did in, in our past life before Christ that we still feel guilty about. That there are things, there are mistakes that we, that we do. We repent of them. We, we, we walk away from them. Or maybe we have reconciled relationships that are broken, but we still feel a sense of guilt. We need to forgive ourselves sometimes just as much as we need to forgive other people. So in this, in this passage, there is a great message of forgiveness, forgiving others, forgiving ourselves, and letting go of our grudges and not holding wrongs. There's a great lesson of forgiveness. But there's another thing that we see uh, working out in this passage as well. Besides Joseph's actions, we see that God himself was working uh, working out a plan. He is fully involved in this situa situation. And, and we see two uh, seemingly contradictory things happening at the same time. And that is, on, on one hand, you have humans making stupid choices. You have people living their own free will, doing the things that they want to do according to their own desires, uh, sometimes with destructive consequences. And yet, we still see that God in his sovereignty, meaning God is Lord and he is in control and, and he has a plan and he is working out. He is working out a plan. Like he is using stupid mistakes of human imperfect people in order to do some great thing. So despite the, the bad choices of the brothers, despite some of the mistakes that Jacob makes in his life, and, and in spite of the fact that maybe Joseph was a little bit arrogant in his younger days, that God was still working out a plan. He was working something good to happen. And Joseph makes it obvious. Like, that God has sent me here so that I could preserve life, so that I could preserve your lives, so that I could preserve even this whole uh, land of Egypt and the region who was suffering from this great famine. God had sent me here. God had given me these abilities. God had given me this wisdom so that, that I could help preserve life. But it wasn't just when, when, you, when you look, uh, take a step back, and you look at the rest of the story of Scripture, God's plan does not end when Jacob and his family move into the section of Egypt called Goshen, where they're able to prosper and, and expand their, themselves as a nation. 
that the plan wasn't yet completed. God was working something even greater in the future. Because eventually, the nation of Israel, um, there, there arises a Pharaoh who does not know Jacob or Joseph or any of these people. He doesn't know why there are all these Hebrews in the midst of their nation. And so he makes them into slaves. But then God eventually leads these, this nation out of slavery in Egypt. And eventually this nation of Israel, they make really bad choices. They split in half and one nation completely turns to idols and God wipes them off the face of the map. He, he conquers them and scatters them to, uh, to uh, the four winds of the earth, metaphorically, as Assyria comes and conquers them. And then eventually the southern half of the kingdom that is left, they too turn to idols and God says, you know, you're a bunch of idiots. I'm going to discipline you by sending you into captivity in, in Babylon. For 70 years they are in, uh, oppressed under the thumb of Babylonian rule. And then even after that, as they are allowed to go home under the, the Persians, that they are still... Under the, thumb, under the thumb of some other world power instead of being their own nation. Uh, but yet, God is still preserving them as a nation. And then Rome comes to power, and there is this toddler, this, this baby who was born in Bethlehem. He grows up as a, as a toddler. The, the, the uh, kingdom of Rome, uh, under, the authority of, under the authority of Rome, the king of the Jews attempts to have Jesus slaughtered. And then the Jewish and Roman officials, as Jesus is going about his ministry, uh, the Jewish and Roman officials collude to get rid of him. And then Jesus is laid in a tomb for three days, and then he comes back to life. So the plan wasn't done, and it really still isn't fully accomplished until Jesus returns. God was working something even greater than what he was doing in, in the land of of. Egypt, by saving the people there, he was working so that he could preserve life, not only for a short time, but for all eternity. God was working a plan so that all of us could be saved from our sins. We could be saved from our rebellions, our, our stupid choices, so that the baggage that we accumulate through life can be taken away with, or taken away from us, or be used to do something good. So God was working a mighty plan to save us, save the world from its sins. And God used the stupid mistakes of sinful people in order to accomplish that plan. So we see that God has a plan, that God was working a plan, and yet he still allows us free will. But this reminds me also of a passage uh, from Romans chapter 8. As Paul is writing uh, to the, the church in Rome to en encourage them, uh, he mentions that uh, we have the Spirit with us. And sometimes when we are overwhelmed by life, when we have uh, baggage and, and circumstances uh, put upon us and we have no idea how to handle it, he says that we have the Holy Spirit who intercedes to God on our behalf. Like the Holy Spirit knows what we need to ask when we have no words to ask. The Holy Spirit knows what to ask, and so he asks God on our behalf. And that, that is an amazing thing. It should be encouraging to us that sometimes, yes, we are overwhelmed. Yes, we have no uh, answers to the questions that we seek. And yet the Holy Spirit is still seeking God's will on our behalf. That is amazing that God is having conversations with himself for our benefit. That is just so awesome that God is so concerned about us. He talks about how God is on our side. He has our back. And then in uh, verse 28, we pick up this, where he says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he uh, would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now here, Paul is not saying that God picks and chooses everybody who was saved. Uh, that's a Calvinist teaching that basically says that God predestined before time who would be saved. 
What Paul is really saying is that God knew who would accept Jesus, who would, ex- who would seek after God, those who would long after God, and God predestined that they have a way of salvation which is being conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, God knew who would accept him, so he sent Jesus uh, so that our sins could be forgiven. That was the plan of God that he is working throughout the whole entire Old Testament. And then he, he goes off, um, he's, he's making this logical um, step-by-step process to show that even though we're going to be going through some difficult circumstances, we are on God's side. So eventually we are going to be glorified, that we are going to be in his presence, we're going to be forgiven, we're going to have this eternal life, and it is going to be awesome. And then after this, Paul goes into this great, uh, great encouraging section where he says that nothing in all of uh, the spiritual realm or the physical realm can take us away from God. There is no power that can take us from God except for our own stupid choices. But even though there might be terrible circumstances that happen in life, even though there are people that are going to persecute us, even like in, the, uh, in Rome, the city of Rome, as these people are eventually uh, persecuted and they're put up on uh, poles to be lit on fire to light the streets of Rome, like terrible things, these people are going to happen that none of these things can take them away from God. And despite the terrible things that they are going to face, God, uh, Paul says that God can use them for good. That God could somehow take the fact that there are Christians being burned alive, that, that God could use that for good. Or that eventually later when they are forced to fight in the Colosseum against wild animals because they don't denounce Christ, that somehow God can use these terrible things for good. Now, sometimes as as I'm uh, think you know preaching through passages like this, um, it's you know you have these great grand theological ideas like God is with you, God will help you, God will make good things happen in, as a result of the things that you're going through. But when you uh, boil that down and you think about some of the terrible things that happen. Sometimes it is hard to see how in the world God can make good happen from this. Like some of the terrible things that we have to endure in life are truly terrible. Some of the bags that we have to carry are horrible. Some of the pain that we experience is beyond what we can handle. And yet it's no different than what the the church in, in Rome was facing with the persecution and with the rejection and, and being ostracized by society because they would not go along with the idolatry. Like the things that they suffered in the first century are just as bad as the things that we suffer in the 21st century. So yes, it might seem like these grand, soaring theological truths, but the fact is that God can use the, good or the bad things in life to bring good things. And we might not see it in our lives. Like the people who are strung up and used as lanterns in Rome, they didn't see the good that would come from their sacrifices. And yet through the years, their stories of endurance, their stories of, of faith, how they endured the flames would encourage generation after generation of Christian to be faithful to Christ no matter what it costs. So we might not see the good in our own lives. We might not see it immediately as we're going through some things, but eventually good happens as a result. Now, here I'm going to use an analogy. I don't want you to get mad. Um, Sometime in in Christianity, we got this idea that we have to only use polite words from the pulpit. Like, there are certain things that you shouldn't say because it's impolite to talk about in in proper society. Like, we got all snooty all of a sudden. Um, Like, there are some... Like, you don't ever talk about poop from the pulpit, right? Or you don't talk about other words related to poop. Um, Now, if you ever read the book of Ezekiel or you read some of the Old Testament, or even when Jesus, when he's talking about that, uh, uh, what makes you unclean, he said it's not what goes in your mouth and then goes to your stomach and then eventually is pooped out. Like, the English translations smooth over some of that to make it more palatable because us American Christians can be wimps about this stuff. Okay, that's my caveat. Don't get mad at me. Uh, Sometimes you have to use salty language-ish. Okay, there's a saying that poop happens. Okay, There, there are different ways of saying that, but poop happens. You cannot help that poop happens. Okay? Now, if you go, if you live on a farm, when poop happens... It's, it's sometimes nasty and you have to watch where you step. But what do farmers do with that poop? Right? You, you 
put it in a huge pile, you let it sit for some time, and then you use it for something good. Like you spread it on your garden, or you put it in your field so that things can grow. You use the bad, stinky, smelly stuff to do something good. Um, one of the worst times that we had in Kentucky, the one of the nastiest times of the year, was when they would take all the poop from the chicken coops, because there were some big chicken farms around. And oh my, ugh. like they would put it in this big slurry truck and then mix it with water and then they'd spray it on the fields, like around. I mean, it was the nastiest. Uh, uh, even manure from pigs doesn't amount to chicken. It's like the nastiest thing. But they did it. Like all the, you know, that time of year was the worst. When you see that, that you know, the bottle trucks that we have driving around here, when you see one of those with tractor tires driving in the field, you don't go outside. It was really nasty. But it made the crops grow really, really well. Okay? So the, the analogy there is that bad things happen. Poop happens in our life, but God can use the junk that happens in our lives to do good things, just like we put it on our gardens in order to make things grow sometimes too well, that God can use the bad things in our life to make good things happen. He can bring great fruits from the bad things in our lives. That fruit might not, might not be evident in our own lives, but it can be evident in the lives of others. And that's really one of the big messages of uh, the, the story of Joseph or what Paul is talking about in Romans, that bad things happen, but God can use those bad, stinky, smelly, terrible things in order to bring really awesome spiritual growth. He can use it to save souls. He can use it to tr tr transform people's lives and to bring people closer to him. So oftentimes when we are carrying baggage, when we have bad things happen to us, we might ask why it happened. So we might ask what good can come from this as we are in the midst of the suffering. But instead of asking why, instead of asking what, we really need to ask who. Who can we turn to in the midst of all the bad things that happen? And the answer is God. We turn to God when things get tough. We might not see the good things that happen in life, but we trust in a good God who is with us no matter what we suffer. And our faithfulness in this life means that we will find goodness in the next. So I don't know what kind of bags that you might be packing. I don't know. Maybe there, there are people, maybe you've, you've dealt with your baggage, but you know people in your life who are carrying a heavy bags. So maybe this message isn't for you. Maybe it's for them. But I know that bags that people carry can affect their marriages. It can impact their children. It can mess with our work lives. It can uh, affect how we treat people when they wrong us, like we start throwing obscenities at the fair, no matter uh, if there are kids around or not. It can affect what we do when the pressure of life gets so heavy. But I do know that God can use these bad things to do good if we let him. And sometimes he'll make good come out of it even if we don't let him. He can bring grace and forgiveness for mistakes that we have made. He can use the pain that we feel to help encourage others when they feel the same sorts of pain. So don't hold the pain. Don't hold the trauma. Don't hold on to the grudges. Don't hold on to the regrets. Don't keep saying, if only things were different. If only that didn't happen. If only I was stronger. If only. Instead, say to yourself, God is faithful to me. I will be faithful to him. 